All righty. Man, they're going to have a great time this morning. <laughs> Go get them, Lord. We're going to have a great time this morning, too. It'll look a little bit different than what they're doing, but we're going to have a good time here, too. Uh, before we jump into, uh, into scripture this morning, I want to just take some time and lead us in prayer. Uh, our, our world is combustible and combusting, and I want us just to take some time and um, go before the Lord together. You know, we've got, uh, you know, there's, there's conflict, uh, war, battles all over the world, and then there are some that just threaten to pull the whole world in. And, uh, and we're seeing more and more of that. And so uh, let me lead us, but let's pray together as his people. Uh, all right, so let's, let's pray. Father, we come before you uh, in, in humility, seeking your mercy and your grace and your peace. We know, Father, that you have taught us that the prince of this world roams all over seeking division, destruction, and death and feeding off those things. And that wars are his handiwork. And today, as your people, marked by your grace, called by your love, redeemed by your blood, we stand before you in humility and cry out for your mercy. For you are the Prince of Peace. You are the one who brings peace and order to a chaotic, divided, war-torn world. And we pray that you would. That you would push back the spiritual forces that animate the division and animosity. That you would push back the, the spirits of war and anger and retribution and violence. And that you would make your peace known. We pray specifically for the people of Israel and Gaza and Iran today. These nations at the forefront of this conflict that seeks to draw the whole world in. We pray, God, for those who are innocent bystanders and even victims of this. And we pray for those who are grieving loss, who have been displaced, who are scared we pray that they would be drawn to you as the Prince of Peace and the Creator of life. May they know you, Father God. For those in political leadership in these nations and those who would influence these nations, we pray that you would rise up men and women of peace with voices loud and strong with a clarion call in truth and grace to be ambassadors of your peace into this world. I pray that you would give these political leaders wisdom beyond themselves, whether they call you Lord or not. Bring wisdom to them through your spirit, through the voices of your people. God, we pray that you would bring an end, that you would bring an end to the war and strife. We pray for your people, your people, our brothers and sisters in these lands. And we ask God that you would empower them by your spirit with strength and courage to be your voice in the midst of the chaos. Remind them that their brothers and sisters here are with them and praying for them that your spirit might flow freely and powerfully in and through them. And God, even here in our place, when it can seem so removed from the happenings of the world, I pray that you would grow our awareness of what you're up to in this world. I pray that you would empower us by your spirit to be ambassadors of peace in the world in which we live. That those of us who have been marked by your grace redeemed by your blood, would ourselves be people of peace. That we would leverage the influence that you have given us wherever that looks, in our families, in our places of work, amongst our friends, in our community, that you would empower, that you would empower us by your spirit to speak peace, to be peacemakers not peacekeepers who too easily duck our heads in the sand, 
not vitriolic uh, mongers of violence and power, but peacemakers in the way of Jesus, empowered by his love alive in us through his spirit. Do that work in us, we pray. Continue to shape our vision of what you're doing, that we might join you in those spaces and be a part of your mission, your purpose and uh, your intended purpose to renew all things beginning with redeeming people of all nations. We want to be a part of that, Lord. And so lead us and guide us and draw us to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, as we look at scripture, it, uh, it actually draws us into the story of God that continues in this day, right? And this is one of the reasons that we do this. It's a big reason that we do this because it helps orient us to the things that we see happening in our world, either the larger world or even just the, the, the itty bitty world that most of us occupy. And so we look at this story and the thing that continues to unfold before us is this dynamic between uh, humility and pride, humility and pride. And we, we see this at play in the world around us. We see this at play in our own lives, this tension that exists between pride and humility. You think about people who are anchored in pride and such a spirit of entitlement comes out, right? Right? Have you ever known somebody who has just this entitlement mindset? I've run into them. Sometimes it's just shopping. Sometimes it's walking down the road. Sometimes it's on social media. Sometimes it's in the mirror in my bathroom. I run into people of entitlement. And as I hit that, I go, Ugh, like, I don't like that. You don't like that either. Like person who just walks and said, I'm kind of entitled to this. You owe me this, right? I'm just going to take this for what I want. Ugh, nobody really likes that. And the flip side of this, like pride fuels that entitlement and humility fosters gratitude. And so we see those things at play in the the, uh, story that we're going to look at today in 1 Samuel. We see those things begin to form and shape uh, as God reveals himself to us. So turning your Bibles to 1 Samuel, and we're still in chapter 1. We began there last week. We're continuing this story on in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to read verses 20 through 28. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 20 through 28. All right, let you flip there for a second. Look it up on your phone. You can follow on the screen, but it's good to have it in front of you in one way or another so you can refer back to things. So verse 20. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now, when her husband, Elkanah, went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, the priest, and she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. What a radiant and powerful and even a little bit disturbing picture of gratitude. Uh, Here's this woman who begged God. You remember from last week, she pleaded with the Lord, falling before him in humility, seeking the Lord's mercy that he would give her a son. 
And she recognizes that God did precisely this. He had given her this incredible gift. And as we look at her response to this, God's giving of the gift and her response to this gift, we proclaim this truth today that God's faithful provision leads to sacrificial gratitude, which cultivates humility that God honors. Listen to that again. God's faithful provision leads to sacrificial gratitude, which cultivates humility, which God himself honors. So we see here in summary, these last couple of verses, verse 27, we're drawn back into. There's this recognition that, uh, that this woman has, that Hannah has, that God has done this. She cried out to God and God has done this thing. And so we see God's faithful provision, uh, which is a son for Hana and Elkanah. So verse uh, 27, she says right there, reminding Eli, I prayed for this child. This was years before, at least two or three years before. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. See, we see this beautiful humility in her heart of gratitude. And she recognizes that the Lord is the giver of this good gift. She named him Samuel, which in Hebrew, it, it sounds like the word that means asked for. Uh, that's on purpose. She, she is naming her son this because she recognizes that this is the one that she had asked for. And she recognizes that it's a gift. Now, the author of 1 Samuel is also setting us up a little bit. Inspired by God's spirit, he's, he's laying this breadcrumb trail for us of what is to come. For the very thing that God was doing in this woman's life, he was also doing the life of his nation. And Samuel sounds like the Hebrew word for asked for. The specific word is what we would see it as Saul. And we're going to see a character emerge into this story in not too long named Saul, which means the one asked for. And so all the while the stage is being set that there are people who cry out to God, God hears and gives this incredible provision. And this Hebrew word that sounds like asked for is used multiple times in this passage that we had read together. And so Hannah is very clear. She has asked for this and God has delivered this gift. You know, there's something humble about remembering that God has given good gifts. So often it seems to be human nature to cry out for God, Lord, give me this thing, whatever it is that the heart is longing for. And then as soon as we have it, we go running away with it. Look at this thing that I got. Or sometimes we even are brash enough to say, look what I did to get this thing. And we so quickly forget in our pride, we so quickly forget that it is the Lord who provides. Hana did not forget for the Lord provides her a son. And as I said, when we look at what is going on in Hannah's life, this woman's life, it's a, it's a mirror, it's a reflection of what is happening in the life of the nation of Israel. As we look at the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament, we often see that. Not only just out of the one, God blesses the many, but also what God does in the one shows us what God is doing in the many in the community, in the, in the people that are his people. And so what we see emerging here, and the story is yet to unfold, so I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of cheaters here, all right? So don't, you know, you can plug your ears if you don't want to hear what's coming. But this whole thing that's emerging here is God will hear the cry of his people for a leader. In Judges, we see this kind of this tribalism all throughout, this di dividedness. But God is raising up a leader who will unify them as his people. And we're going to see how he does that and how God blesses the humble but opposes the proud in doing so.
And so this very thing that God is doing in the life of this woman is a mirror, is a reflection of what God is doing in the life of his people. But not only is God raising up a leader, some of the things that, that we want to tip our hat to as, um, uh, as, as Hana was approaching the place of worship. So it's in Shiloh, it's uh, north of Jerusalem. It was a place where in, in the sacred tent, sort of a tabernacle, the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the, the Lord was kept in that place in Shiloh. And it would be there until we get a little bit further into the story of 1 Samuel, and then we'll see it leave there. And so this is why that place of worship is so instrumental. That ark was the physical representation of Yahweh in their midst. And so this place of worship was so very important. And so as uh, Elkanah and Hana approached uh, the place of, of worship, what do we see? We see Eli, the priest at Shiloh, and he is sitting in a chair at the doorpost. Now, this might not strike us all that much at first reading, but what I want us to notice, what I want us to see in there is that this is uh, kind of a, a royal picture that's being given. It's a royal picture. It, it's a very similar picture of what it is for a king to sit on a throne. That's, those are the words that are used there. It's the picture that's being drawn for us in this particular story. And so not only is God raising up a leader for his people, we're seeing this royal replacement that there is both a fall of proud leadership in the midst of the raising up of humble leadership. And so these are things for us to keep in mind. And even here at the beginning of this this story, as 1 Samuel unfolds, it's telling us what to look for. It's telling us what to pay attention as the rest of the story unfolds, all right? But in this, we see God's faithful provision to the woman and to his people. And this faithful provision reveals God's character and it reveals God's purpose. We see God's goodness. We see his mercy. We see his, uh, his desire to bless those who call out to him in humility. And we also see that God is a God of his word, he had given his people their co- his covenant word. God is faithful to his word. Listen to that again. God is faithful to his word. And he is faithful to his character. And we see this playing out in God's provision. Now God's faithful provision leads to sacrificial gratitude. Pay attention again. We go back to verse 28, right? So Anna is explaining uh, to Eli. Verse 28, she says, So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This is the real deal. This is the real deal. We see this um, kind of sacrificial gratitude flowing from Hana in a couple of ways. One of those ways we see is in the sacrifice that they bring as a family, right? So it was a couple of years that she didn't join her family in worship at Shiloh. Now she's joining them, bringing a a worship of gratitude in a three-year-old bowl, an ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, kind of cracked me up a little bit when I read there. Can you, can you imagine why there's, there's just even a little bit of humor in this thing? Because when we go back to the part of the story we looked at last week, what did Eli, here she's bringing this offering and you give it to the priest, right? It's, it's an offering to God, but you give it to the priest as this mediary. So she, here she is, she's uh, handing over this jug of wine to Eli, who was the very man two to three years earlier saw her praying passionately before God and said, woman, compose yourself. Stop being drunk in the middle of the day. And she had to explain to herself that she had nothing to drink. She wasn't drunk, but she was praying out to the Lord out of her agony and her. And so here she is, part of her sacrifice is bringing, here, Eli, have some wine, right? There's a little something in there. Like, who says God doesn't have a bit of a sense of humor as he reveals himself to us in this, right? But as we see these sacrifices coming, The bull stands out, a three-year-old bull, a bull at its peak strength, 
It wasn't a weak little sissy bull that was just kind of languishing in a ditch somewhere. This was a gift. It was expensive. It was extravagant. No matter who you were, a three-year-old bull coming as sacrifice. And they weren't just bringing the bull to parade it around and say, everybody, look at our bull. This is great, isn't it? They were coming that the bull would be killed and his blood poured out as an offering before the Lord of gratitude. And so we see the extravagance even in these offerings that they're bringing. But of course, we're struck, almost dumbstruck as the chapter ends. So she brings the child before Eli the priest and she says, I promised the Lord that if he gave me a son, I would give him to him all the days of her life. This was no just promissory note. This was, this was not just a, a token. That last line clues us in. Listen to it again. And he worshiped the Lord there. It wasn't just a, in this moment, they worshiped the Lord. It was he stayed there. bringing this very one that she had sought the Lord for with such passion. And she made good on her word. The Lord heard her cry, gave her this gift. And you remember, she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him to you to serve you all the days of his life. How many times do we, or we observe it in others, cry out to God, God, if you will do this thing, then I will give you my whole life. Then I will give you whatever, right? We, we make our promises to God. And then God provides. And how quickly do we put it back in our pocket? We might not say, well, God, my fingers were crossed, so I didn't really mean it. Like, you should have seen that coming, Yahweh, Right? <laughs> No, we, we, we aren't quite that brazen about it. But what happens over time? God, if you give me this, name your desire, I'll, fo- I'll give you my whole life. And God provides. Oh, God, thank you. We move along a little bit. Well, my whole life is a little bit extreme. I mean, come on, Lord, I've got stuff that I've got to do. I've got to raise a family, like tick tock here, Lord. I can only do so much. I have a really demanding job. God, I can only do so much. Like, like okay, I'm going to go to church every Sunday. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you that. I mean, including travel time for some of us. Like that, That's a few hours a week, Lord. That's pretty decent. Well, it's the masters. I should stay home and watch that or... Oh, it's, it's the soccer game over here. I need to do that. So we're just, like, it's just going to miss the one, right? And, and again, don't let, like, I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about the human heart that is so quick to pull back in the very things we commit ourselves to God for. But here is Hannah's faithfulness expressed in sacrificial gratitude. Dedicating Samuel, her son, her precious one that she had cried out for to the Lord, leaving him in service of the temple and walking away, fulfilling her vow because she knew that God was fulfilling his. This ought to spark in us a little bit of a memory. Remember, the one, the many, Abraham had no children, and God promised that he would give him a son. He and his wife Sarah laughed because they were so old. (laughs) Awkward laugh, insert awkward laugh. God gives him a son, Isaac. And many of you might be familiar with the story. God calls Abraham to sacrifice his son, brings him up a mountain. And there at the moment of sacrifice, God stops, holds his hand back and provides a sheep in the thicket. And together, father and son sacrifice the lamb instead of the son. 
So woven into the story of God's people is this sacrifice, this obedience, this faithfulness in response to God's faithfulness. This is what it means to be the covenant people of God, to walk in faithfulness in response to God's. It's his faithfulness first. And our response of worship, our response of gratitude is faithfulness in return. It's sobering, isn't it? It's disturbing. If we're looking at this, it disturbs us. Are you kidding me? Now, what you don't know is that these families that dedicated their children, they're actually putting them in a special place that we have over here, and we're going to keep them, and they're going to work in the church forever. <laughs> That's how I got where I am today. <laughs> now, like, we don't do those things today, right? But there is a heart. There is a heart of devotion Dedication and sacrifice through extravagant gratitude and worship. When we understand, when we catch a glimpse, we don't have to fully understand, when we catch a glimpse of God's provision, our response is effusive, sacrificial gratitude. And when we find that our hearts are not effusive with gratitude, is because we have become a bit too consumed with ourselves and we're missing the power of God's provision. For God's faithful provision leads us to sacrificial gratitude, which cultivates humility that God honors. We see this in the story, and, and it goes, it, it, does, like, it does this thing, this gratitude does this thing. One, gratitude is a reflection of humility. Gratitude is a reflection of humility. And so gratitude says, this isn't of my own doing. I am not entitled to this. This is not of my own strength, my own intelligence, my own network, my own strength and ability. It is not of myself. It is a gift from God. And it's not a token gratitude at all. It's not just a, well, goodness, shucks, God blessed me. It's a deeply embedded gratitude for the provision of God. For what he has provided. And we also learn that gratitude cultivates humility. Humility. It's like a flywheel that as it begins to turn, it, it circles back on itself. Humility and gratitude. Gratitude is a reflection of humility. Gratitude embeds humility, which reflects gratitude, which embeds humility, which reflects gratitude, which embeds humility. And the flywheel turns to shape a heart that bows down before God as Lord. And we recognize his beautiful provision. It honors the giver of the gift. And gratitude casts off self-sufficiency. And it cultivates in us humility that God is pleased to honor. James 4, 6 reflects a proverb, and we see this woven throughout scripture, that God opposes the proud, but he gives his favor, his blessing, his grace to the humble. The wind of God's spirit comes behind and empowers the humble. But those who insist on standing in their own self-sufficiency face the headwind of God himself. And we live in a world that is steeped in self-sufficiency, do we not? You did this. You made this. Grab the bull by the horns, baby, and go get it. We live in a world that affirms, even demands, self-sufficiency. But as the kingdom of heaven crashes into this world... As God reveals himself as the Lord of new creation, he reveals himself as good and faithful provider even in this day. 
and calls his people to reject the self-sufficiency that the prince of this world demands and to bow low in humility before a God who desires to bless, give his favor to the humble. And so how do we take this into ourselves? How do we embody this for ourselves? Well, we begin to recognize God's faithful provision. Recognize God's faithful provision. See, in Jesus, God has provided for us. Full stop here a second. In Christ, he has given us everything we need for life, peace, joy, flourishing. This is what he has done. And he's already done it. He doesn't owe us anything more. He didn't even owe us that. Like God has already done more for us than we deserve. His grace, his life, his flourishing in Christ is this gift. And we recognize what God has revealed, that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he is renewing all of creation, beginning with reconciling lost, rebellious, broken, sinful people. That's me. He begins his renewal by calling selfish, broken, rebellious people, enemies of God, reconciling us to him. And he does so with the lost and rebellious and sinful of every nation, drawing us to himself through the forgiveness of sin and unleashing the power of resurrection as the kingdom of heaven draws near in our midst. He is a faithful God. He is faithful to his word. He has told us from the very beginning, this is what he will do. He is doing it in our midst and he will complete it upon his return just as he promised he would. And so we proclaim the beautiful provision of God for forgiveness and life and call any who would believe to enter in to this reconciling relationship with God. God faithfully provides. God faithfully provides. God faithfully provides. And then even beyond that, God faithfully provides. God faithfully provides. When when his will and purpose aligns with our desires, God provides in our midst. God provides uh, for so many. What you have been given, God provides. For some, it's family. For some, it's strength and singleness. For others, it's healing and freedom. For others, it's hope and healing. God provides. In this day, God provides. If we don't recognize God's provision, then our act of worship and gratitude is likely just to be a facade. But when we are captured by the depth and the beauty and the power of his provision... Our worship is fueled with gratitude that is sacrificial, that is extravagant in our own terms. There's the sacrificial dedication of ourself to the purpose of God through humble submission to him and the giving of self for his purpose. Jesus talked about this. If anybody wants to have their life, they need to give it up. Do you want to be my disciples, Jesus said? Fantastic. Pick up your cross and follow me. The way of the master is the way of the cross. It is the way of self-emptying and sacrifice of self. In the very ways that the prince of this world says, own yourself, know yourself, build yourself. Jesus says, lose yourself, give up yourself, die to yourself. That in the giving up, in the sacrifice, in the submission, you might know life. 
And so there's the way that we approach our lives, our very selves. As we dedicate ourselves to the purpose of God. When you go to work, it's for the purpose of God. When you raise your family, it is for the purpose of God. When you hang out with your friends, it is for the purpose of God. When you walk through your neighborhood, it is for the purpose of God. Do you begin to see? God's provision, what he has offered you, is the gift we get to offer back to him in extravagant sacrifice. God, the life I have, I only have because of you. And the life you have provided, I give to you as a sacrifice of gratitude. It's a daunting thing, is it not? You think of the things that might be lost with a person living like that. Maybe a reputation, as people kind of snicker on the side of, that person's a Jesus freak. That person's kind of a religious nut job. That person's kind of a, a weirdo in how they approach their life. They're nice and all, but uh, a little bit out there. People who live in self-sacrifice. Sacrifice everything. Our very selves. Think about the gifts that God has given. That is what we offer in return. Think about this uh, in our family, right? So we got to dedicate these children, these, these parents, dedicate their child and just to be clear, they're not leaving them here for the rest of their life. But they are, are recognizing these children as a gift. Do you hear that? And that they will do, they will participate with God, that their role as parents is not self-satisfaction. Sometimes we can convince ourselves that our role as parents is just self-satisfaction. It's our turn to redo what didn't go right in our lives. It's our time to relive what did go right in our lives. It's our, our way that we fulfill those inner vows of I will or I'll never or things like that. And so we, we leverage our children for our own good. But a parent that brings their child and says, God, this child is here for, for your good and glory. We have, it, it shapes our parenting. It shapes the way that we invest ourselves in these children. We recognize that our role is not self-satisfaction with our children, but rather it's the self-emptying. One of the things I've learned about kids is they really have shown me the places that I am oh so far away from Jesus. Selfishness, just like I thought I'd been doing pretty good, but just like brrr, erupts out of me in the midst of this. Self-sacrifice. How we shape our children in the ways of God. We can't guarantee an outcome, but we can guarantee that they experience the love of God through us. So when we approach our kids with fearful control, that's different than loving self-sacrifice. Helping our children know and understand, shaping their identity, shaping their character shaping their understanding of their purpose in the world. This is what it means to parent. This is what it is to be a grandparent, an aunt and an uncle, a spiritual mother and father in the lives of the children particularly around us as we pour ourselves out for their good and God's glory. Honestly, being a dad is one of the things that has made me feel the most inadequate. It's not because my, my kids are amazing. It's because of me. It just makes me confront my own inadequacies, my own weaknesses, my own frailties in ways that sometimes I get so frustrated by. And yet I begin to recognize that is God self-emptying good for me. I recognize my kids are a gift that he has given. And there are some moments where I feel like God has, has empowered something good <laughs> along this line. Um, I had heard about this idea uh, long before I even had kids, and it was always something that kind of tucked in the repertoire for back there if I ever had the chance, and then I get the chance. And um, just kind of to, to mark certain moments of their lives, a, a dedication like this, like we saw today, is a, a marker in a moment of their children's lives. But as they grow into teenage and adulthood, there's so often, particularly in our culture, there's not a lot of 
ways that we help our kids uh, mark the moment. We just kind of leave them on their own. And so it's when they can buy a car, when they can have sex, when they can pay some bills, um, then you're a man or then you're a woman. And it's kind of this magical thing that they keep striving for. And so that was the thing that stuck in me. And so I wanted to create some of these moments along the way where I would uh, teach them and show them and kind of rise above the fog and be able to have a vision for where we're going. And uh, so I, I, I was the primary executor of this with my boys, got two boys. Uh, Heidi was the primary executor of this with our daughter. Um, we both kind of blessed along the way, but there were some of these moments that were um, really specific. And so I wanted to train my boys and, and show them a vision of, of manhood in the ways of the Lord. And so there was a day that we uh, took a hike. Uh, we live in a wonderful place to be able to take a hike together. And it was uh, right around their 16th birthday that we marked this. Um, they had different 16th birthdays, so it was just one at a time. And I had preloaded the trail with some men who were important to me in my life, and each of these men had something to give to my son, um, wisdom about a certain area of life. And so um, I remember driving there, uh, building up the anticipation, because I'm like, son, you know, this is the day. Keep this day clear from this time to this time I own you. You can do stuff afterwards, but after, during this time I own you. So we're driving, driving, driving. He's getting all like, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And, um, are you going to buy me a car? I am not going to buy you a car. Um, but, so what is, what is it? What is it? What is it? And so we, we get to the base of the, 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 where the trail is going to begin. Kind of think, okay, so we're going to hike up a mountain. And then we walk a little bit and I begin to explain. I'm going to walk with you for a little bit here, but I'm going to leave you in the hands of this man. And he's going to talk to you about some things. And I'm going to journey on to the top of the mountain. And then when he's done talking to you about this, he's going to walk with you. And there'll be another man on the trail. And then he's going to walk his way to the top of the mountain. And over the course of a couple of hours, this manhood journey took place up to the top of the bald mountain where all of us were waiting with my son uh, and the last man on the journey. And together we had a moment on the top of this mountain to look and to see. It's a of course, a metaphor for life. We get these moments when we get to see the vision of our lives where God shapes the vision of this life and marks you. And we got to have a little ceremony on the top of this mountain where we welcomed him into the community of men. Now, I was told him, like, these are my men and you're gonna grow and you're gonna get your men. But in the meantime, you can borrow my men. You're gonna have questions. You're gonna need community. You're gonna need to know you're not alone. You can borrow my men until you get yours. And it cast a vision for what this looks like, manhood and community. And together we walked down that mountain and there was, for both of them, there was this spring and a step. There was this, this moment that was captured and it did something for them. It did something for them. And I know, again, Heidi did that same kind of a thing with our daughter and the community of women along that trail. And we mark these moments. Parents, it's not about how we build their resume it's how we build their souls in participation with God. That is the true calling of parenting. It's the truth of what it means to pour out ourself that they might know who they are in God, that their character might be shaped by him, and they begin to cast a vision and have a vision for what life looks like in the purposes of God. It doesn't guarantee outcomes, but it embeds something real in a moment. And that's just one example of what it looks like. And you have your examples of what that looks like as we pour ourselves out in our family, as we pour ourselves out in our work. If the goal is just accomplishment to retirement, we're missing our good and God's glory. As we pour ourselves out in our work, it transforms our approach to work, whether our work is mundane or exciting. As we approach the days of what we would call retirement, our purpose remains steadfast because we continue to pour ourselves out for him. God's faithful provision leads to sacrificial, extravagant gratitude which cultivates humility that God himself loves to bless. Let me pray for us. Father, we stand before you today as people who uh, have been transformed by your grace. So many of us, some of us are still trying to figure it out. And I pray that you would awaken all of us as you call the lost, rebellious, broken, and sinful to yourself. Do so in our midst today. 
And then, God, I pray that you would uh, receive our thanks for your good, faithful provision. Thanks not just with words, but with lives that are poured out in extravagant, sacrificial gratitude. Which we know is for our good and for your glory. Lead us into that, we pray. In your mercy, lead us into that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you would. God has provided much through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus. He has poured out new life and thrown open the doors of invitation that you might know that life. If you have never received life through faith in Jesus and the forgiveness of sin, you can do that today. He has made turned enemies into sons and daughters. If you are ready for that faith step today, our prayer team is gonna be up here. You just come up and tell us, I wanna give my life to Jesus today and we'll pray that you might know this new life. If there's any other reason we can pray for you, we'd love to do that as well. But no, he has given you this beautiful, extravagant gift through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that life is yours. Receive it as good, beautiful, extravagant gift. And then give yourself, pour yourself out in love and gratitude, in sacrificial, in sacrificial worship. May your life be characterized in these ways as you walk with him. May his peace be yours. May his love be yours. May his healing and strength be yours as you walk with him. Thanks for being here.